in contrast to the surface of Kerbin, where economic theories and government styles compete for supremacy, the exploration of space so far has remained a peaceful endeavor. How long can peace remain in the heavens? Only time will tell. This is Echo 3, and let's continue discussing the Cold War. The Central Kerbin Alliance Network's current focus is the exploration of the mine. Fairings will enable the program to launch more sophisticated craft with the current goal to land a rover on the surface of the mine. Construction of a rover commences in the hangar facility. The mod Textures Unlimited Recolor Depot is used to change the color on these parts. The cubic family strut piece is from the mod Near Future Construction. Six Rove Max wheels should provide a stable platform for this rover. Hopefully, all the different science experiments on this rover will provide back a wealth of data about the MUN, which in turn should pave the way for a future crewed mission. If the Central Kerbin Alliance Network is able to send the first Kerbals to the surface of the MUN and return them, it would greatly increase their image on the world stage against the Communists. With the craft's electrical systems and communication systems finished, it's time to take it over to the Vehicle Assembly Building and set it to a rocket. Engineers have proposed using a type of sky crane to deliver the rover to the MUN surface safely. This method ensures that the rover is out of the way of the engines during flight, and that the engines are out of the way of the rover after it's landed. The interior engines are angled out just slightly to ensure that the engine exhaust does not destroy the rover's wheels. Struts are then added to help keep the rover secure during its long flight. With delicate parts like solar panels and wheels, engineers think that this is an excellent opportunity to test out the new fairings to help protect the craft. Currently, the Delta V budget of this craft allows it to go from low Kerbin orbit to orbit of the MUN and then land softly on its surface. So the rest of the rocket needs to be able to get the rover into low Kerbin orbit. This upper stage, using a single swivel engine, will power the craft through the upper atmosphere to almost orbital velocity. The core stage, using a swivel engine, will provide most of the control during the ascent, while two boosters on the outside, using Reliant engines, will help the craft have a high enough thrust to weight ratio to get off the pad. With the very large fairing on top of the rocket, several sets of fins will be needed in order to keep it stable during the ascent. Another trick that the engineers use to help keep the rocket stable is to set the fuel priority flow on the tanks so that the bottom tanks will drain first and help keep the center of mass shifting forward during the flight. And Roby is ready for launch. The boosters propel the rocket up to 10,000 meters. At that point, it'll be a little bit more stable and they can tilt the rocket further over, trying to keep the rocket inside the prograde vector. The core stage then gets the rocket up to 40,000 meters and about 1,300 meters per second in velocity. At this point, the upper stage will then accelerate the rocket almost up to orbital velocity. The upper stage has done its part, and now the payload will be able to take itself the rest of the way to the MUN surface. The rover will circularize around 140 kilometers above the surface. The maneuver to put the craft into orbit will also be very close to the same maneuver to put the craft on an intercept of the MUN, as the MUN is in an ideal location to eject from Kerbin. If all goes according to plan, this will be Kerbal Kind's first object to softly touch down on the MUN's surface. That is, unless the Communist beat everyone else there and didn't tell anyone. The ejection burn from Kerbin has set the rover on an excellent intercept course with the MUN. The low periapsis will result in a more efficient insertion burn and a less costly deorbit burn. Because this is a remotely controlled, solar-powered craft, engineers need to consider the position of the sun and the position of Kerbin as the craft travels through space. With solar panels only on one side of the craft, it needs to keep those pointed towards Kerbal. And because the craft is remotely controlled, it needs to keep line of sight with Kerbin in order to perform any maneuvers. Using the biome map generated by the polar orbiter, scientists have found a good location for landing the rover. It is near three different biomes and will mean short drives to different places to explore. Again, engineers keep the solar panels pointed towards Kerbal during the descent until it's time to perform the landing burn. Waiting to perform the landing burn as long as possible will help make it more efficient. Using a tool like the suicide burn counter on Kerbal Engineer Redo can be very helpful for this. This craft isn't equipped with that, so it is relying entirely on Valentina's skill as a pilot to land this thing remotely from Kerbin. 
and she does an excellent job with 40 meters per second of delta V to spare. Once on the surface, scientists get busy recording all kinds of data. The main scientific instruments are a thermometer and a barometer, although the barometer keeps saying there's no atmospheric pressure. If you are curious, I am using the mod Parallax to improve the quality of my surface textures. The ScanSat data is also useful on the surface for helping the rover find the next biome to explore. It can also be used to set waypoints and help the craft find a good path to navigate. While not currently installed on my computer, the mod Bon Voyage is also useful for your rovers. It can drive the rover while you are away doing something else, or while you're time warping. As is, I'm stuck driving the rover, so I'm going to cut out most of the trip until I get to the next location. At least the rover handles well. Since the Central Kerbin Alliance Network is not averse to capitalism, if a Kerbal wants to pay to go into space, they are very happy to oblige. Tito is willing to pay to get into orbit, and Breebe is willing to pay to get out of orbit. The Kerbals over at R&D say they have finally developed some better landing gear. With improved landing gear, the dreams of a space plane have become a reality. Tito's very large down payment has funded the development of an experimental shuttlecraft. As a reminder to any future paying customers, all sales are final and the down payment is non-refundable. A craft like this has a couple advantages over a traditional capsule. One is that much of the craft will be able to be recovered. The other is that with the wings, the craft will be able to pick its landing site a lot more easily. With much of the planet at odds with the Central Kerbin Alliance network, it is important to land in friendly territory. By setting the vertical stabilizers and rudders out at the tips of the wings, the rudders can be deployed to act as a kind of cheap air brake. The American Space Shuttle actually did something very similar, except its single rudder would split left and right so that it would act as an air brake during descent. These retractable landing gear will be better able to handle the heat of re-entry. Power generation will come from these four solar panels placed out on the wingtips. Like the rover, this craft will then need to be mindful of its orientation relative to Kerbal. After some final tweaks to the craft's aerodynamics, it will be taken over to the vehicle assembly building to be mated with the rest of the rocket. The shuttle uses a single Terrier engine, which has very poor performance in the lower atmosphere, so the shuttle's engine will not fire until it is much higher up in the atmosphere. Most of the ascent will use two strap-on liquid fuel boosters. The shuttle's center of mass was already balanced in the space plane hangar, so a couple boosters should easily be able to be mounted onto the front and back of the craft. Although heavier than the Reliant, engineers have opted to use the swivel engine because it is able to gimbal. The boosters need to be mounted as high as possible to keep the center of mass above the center of aerodynamic pressure. The thrust to weight ratio is just a little low, so a couple strap-on solid rocket motors are used for the initial part of the ascent. Because Valentina did such an excellent job remotely piloting the rover to the MUN surface, she has now been afforded the opportunity to fly the shuttle on its maiden flight. Tito's contract stipulates that he gets to spend at least four hours in orbit around Kerbin. This works out just fine because Valentina will need to perform several different maneuvers in order to get an intercept with Breebe's craft. The Terrier engine performs well enough in the upper atmosphere that it is able to accelerate the craft up to orbital velocity and get a good intercept with Johnny's craft. It is unclear why so many different Kerbals keep getting stranded in orbit around the planet. However, the capitalistic nature of the Central Kerbin Alliance Network means that they are very willing to take the money and rescue them. Valentina combines her orbital insertion burn with her rendezvous burn so that in less than one orbit she is able to intercept the target craft. As Valentina approaches Johnny's craft, she will burn on the target side of the retrograde marker on her nav ball so that she is able to match orbits with the target craft. After getting a very close encounter with the target, Valentina just needs to reduce her relative velocity so that Johnny is able to EVA over. The only hatch for the craft is up by the cockpit, so the Kerbals will have to shuffle around in the crew section in order to get everyone in. Now that Johnny is safely aboard, Valentina will need to perform a maneuver to get an intercept with Burby's craft. Currently, their orbital periods are very similar, but the crafts are on opposite sides of the planet, so Valentina is going to increase her orbit, thus increasing her orbital period and letting the other craft catch up to her. Fortunately, this all works out very well with Tito's schedule. And in the same way, Valentina is going to burn on the target side of the retrograde marker as she approaches the intercept. 
And once Valentina's craft is traveling slow enough and close enough, Burby is able to transfer over with EVA just like Johnny did and get into the crew compartment. All that remains now is for Valentina to deal with the craft and land back at the runway. If you are curious about trying to land a space plane back at the runway, I do have a tutorial covering that exact topic. And like most things in this game, it does get easier with practice. Valentina appears to be coming in a little too fast and too high to land on the west side of the runway, so she will be able to turn the craft around with all of its remaining energy and come back and land on the east side of the runway. She can even burn the Terrier engine to help make sure she has enough velocity to make it all the way back to the runway. It's also not a bad idea to lighten the craft just a little bit. And she takes it in smoothly, watching her vertical descent speed so she doesn't slam on the runway too hard. And she did it. She has just brought in a lot of cash for the program. The Central Kerbin Alliance Network has tasked the agency with developing an aircraft that is capable of breaking Mach 2 and flying up as high as 20,000 kilometers. Running the numbers, this seems just barely possible with the current level of technology, although it's going to take a craft with three of the Weasley engines in order to make this happen. Overall, it's not a very complex build, it just has a really high thrust to weight ratio. Of course, if the aerospace program is able to develop a craft like this, the next thing you know, they'll be tasked with developing some kind of Mach 3 capable spy plane. The Weasley performs best at low altitudes, so Jebediah made a speed run at 2700 meters above the surface. Then he points the craft up about 45 degrees and easily surpasses the 20 kilometer mark. All that's left is for Jebediah to regain control of the craft in the lower atmosphere and fly it back home. While this craft is capable of achieving Mach 2, it can only do so at lower altitudes. A craft with newer engines will be needed to fly high enough and fast enough to avoid the communist anti-aircraft missiles. As it is though, the agency has proven that it is capable of achieving Mach 2 in level flight. If you are enjoying the color scheme on this aircraft, this was also done using the Textures Unlimited Recolor Depot. And Jebediah safely lands the plane, although it was coming in really fast and he goes past the edge of the runway, but he brings it back on. No problems, Jeb. The Mun rover has been hard at work exploring different biomes on the surface. It is now approaching its third biome. This will provide a lot of scientific data for the Central Kerbin Alliance network. The polar orbiter has picked up something odd in this crater. The rover is going over to check it out. It is some kind of communist weaponized probe. So much for the Outer Space Weapons Treaty Ban. Looks like the MUN has just gone hot.